Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church. We're going to be talking this morning about Christians and alcohol. Now, the issue of alcohol and Christianity is an incredibly volatile subject, causing a lot of division, a lot of harsh judgments on both sides. Among Christians, there's two primary camps, as there just about is on everything, with this very sensitive topic. The first group argues that there's nothing wrong with alcohol, nothing in the Bible that condemns it, Yeshua himself drank it, and since a Christian is a follower of Yeshua, how can that be forbidden? Right? Amen. And then you got the other position. Alcohol is an addictive, it's a destructive drug, and no sincere Christian should touch it in any shape or form. Now, I want to tell you, I've been on both sides of this argument. Okay? Matter of fact, I've probably been on both sides of most arguments. <laughs> Which really helps you, you know, because you've been on the other side. You know what the other side teaches. You know what they believe. And now you know both sides of it. So, <laughs> and, and in the midst of these two dramatic polls, there's all kinds of different variations, you know, on alcohol. Um, let's look at our text in Ephesians first. And then we're going to look at what the rest of the Bible has to say and just kind of deal with the subject of alcohol. Because, like I said, it's a, it's a big controversy in the church in America. Always has. It's kind of an American thing, though, people. Other countries don't have a problem with alcohol. Okay? This is an American problem. All right, we've been talking about our walk, which is dealing with our conduct as Christians. Ephesians 5.15 says, Therefore, be careful how you walk. And then Paul explains what he means by this with three antitheses. Not... This, but this. In the following clause, he says, not as unwise, but as wise. Not as foolish, he says, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And then he says in our text, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. In verse 15, in 17, Paul first states the negative, and then he follows it with the positive. Now, this morning, we're going to just look at the negative. All right, in the following weeks, we'll get into what it means to walk in the Spirit. But this morning, I just wanted to deal with the subject of do not get drunk with wine. There it is. You see it? It's clear as enough in the text. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's exactly <laughs> All right, listen. That's clear enough, right? It's clear enough. Do not get drunk. But someone is bound to say, as they already did this morning, what about beer? There you go. What about whiskey? It doesn't say that, right? Listen, the point here is, do not get drunk. That's the point. I'm not talking about the means if you want grain, alcohol, whatever else. The point here is do not get drunk. Now, the word drunk here is a present passive imperative of Methusko. And the prohibition here expressed with the present imperative could suggest that Paul's exhorting them to stop an action or prohibiting them from a course of action. In other words, Christians, we've been talking about wisdom. This is not wise. Don't do this. Listen, the Bible condemns drunkenness. It's depicted by Paul as epitomizing the ways of darkness. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 through 8. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. Unless you're really bad off. <coughs> Drunkenness, he is saying, is part of the night. We as Christians are of the day, and we are to be sober. He says, but since we are of the day, let us be sober. Romans 13, 12 and 13, the night is almost gone, the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity 
and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. So we are not to partake in that. The culture addressed, in our culture, drunkenness is considered an addiction. It's considered a disease. Which, if you've got a disease, I don't know what you're going to do about it. But if you understand that the Bible says it's a sin, it's not a disease, then you can deal with it in your life. We are light, believers, and we are to walk in that light. He says in 5.8, and you were formerly darkness. We were part of that. He says, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now, one very clear way to act as a fool is to get drunk. That's the antithesis of wisdom, is drunkenness. He says, for that is dissipation. Dissipation is from the Greek asutia. It's a presumed derivative of sozo. You all familiar with sozo? Sozo means saved. This is unsavedness. In other words, saved is the idea of deliverance. This is not deliverance, all right? A modern slang, you could say wasted. It points to wastefulness, destruction of property, relationships. A lot of things go along with that term of drunkenness. Now the adverb form of this is used in Luke 15, 13 of a way that the prodigal son wasted and spent his inheritance on loose living. It means to be out of control because alcohol controls the person. And so he's saying in our verse, don't be controlled by alcohol. Be controlled by the Spirit. Now some say that Paul's reference here to drunkenness is religious. They connect it with the mystery cult of Dionysius, which was the god of wine. Drunkenness was associated with pagan religion. The pagans believed that to commune with the gods, you had to put yourself in a drunken stupor to come into the highest level of communion with the gods. I don't know what that says about the gods, but you've got to get really drunk to commune with them. All right? Well, the difficulty with this interpretation is the lack of clear evidence. All right? Maybe that's true, but there's really no evidence of that. And I think it's unlikely because Paul doesn't mention it directly as, as a religious practice of theirs as he does in other places. Now, drunkenness no doubt occurred both inside and outside the religious practice of the day. And all drunkenness is condemned in Scripture. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. This is the direct command against drunkenness. The Spirit of God is saying children of light are not to be drunk. Drunkenness is a work of the flesh. Galatians 5.19 Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity. I'm skipping a lot of them, so this will fit on the screen. But drunkenness. Now no, notice what he says. Just as I forewarned you, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a severe warning. Those people don't get in the kingdom. You're in the kingdom, so you live differently. The Bible warns against drunkenness. A believer is not to be drunk. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about drunkenness. It says, wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler. Whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. Now we're talking in this section about being walking in wisdom as believers. We're to walk in wisdom. To get, be, to get drunk, to be drunk, is not wise. Proverbs 23, 19. Listen, my son, and be wise. Again, there's that contrast. Direct your heart to the way. Do not be with heavy drinkers of wine or with gluttonous eaters of meat, for the heavy drunker and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe one with rags. I think you've seen that illustration. You see the person who ends up in the gutter because of drunkenness. I've seen so many people destroyed because of alcoholism, and there seems to be a potential when you fall in the bottle, they don't ever come out. I saw my brother work for years and years with his best friend who was also an employee to try to help him get out of this. He'd gone through wife after wife, job after job. It just it didn't end well. You end up on the street, you end up with nothing. In verse 29, he gives us a vivid picture of drunkenness. He says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? I love that one. I can remember <clears throat> in my high school days getting in a fight as I was drunk and just 
bragging about it afterwards. He never laid a hand on me. The next morning, I had a bunch of bruises all over my body. I'm like, where did those come from? You know, I didn't, they were wounds without cause. How did that happen? Because you don't know. Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long over the wine, those who go to taste mixed wine. He's saying abuse of alcohol will mess you up. He goes on to describe it. At last, it bites like a serpent. It stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. Oh, we understand that one, right? And your mind will utter perverse things. I've seen that. How many times have you seen that? You know, they're uttering, they're seeing things, they're uttering strange things. He goes on, and you will be like one. This is a vivid picture here. You'll be like one who lies down in the middle of the sea. I can remember coming home and putting my foot off the bed to touch the floor to try to keep that bed from spinning. The bed wasn't really spinning, but it sure felt like it was. I felt like I was in the midst of the sea. Or like one who lies down at the top of a mast. Now, you know at the top, that motion is way greater than down low, okay? He says, they struck me, but I did not become ill. They beat me, but I did not know it. When shall I awake? I will seek another drink. See, that's the, that's the sadness of it. It can mess you up so bad, yet, you know, people do the dumbest things. And I said this before, but of the Christians I know who have done really stupid things, they've done it under the influence of alcohol. I mean, really. They, they've, they've ruined their marriage. They've lost their job. They've done something stupid under the influence because it will ruin you. Brad Paisley's written a song called Alcohol. Ever heard that song? It really, it would be funny if it wasn't so true. Some of the lyrics say, I can make anybody pretty. This is speaking of alcohol, okay? Alcohol is speaking. I can make anybody pretty. I can make you believe any lie. I can make you pick a fight with someone twice your size. We used to call it canned excitement, you know? Because you drink that stuff, you get, you know, you can take on the world. I've been known to cause a few breakups. I've been known to cause a few births. I can make you new friends or get you fired from work. I've influenced kings and world leaders. I've helped Hemingway write like he did. I'll bet you a drink or two I can make you put that lampshade on your head. Alcohol. And that's what alcohol can do. You know, it, it can really, and like I said, it can really destroy a person's life. In other words, alcohol can make you a fool. And that's the contrast here in Proverbs. And I think all Christians should agree. I don't think there should be any debate among them that the Bible expressly forbids being drunk. It condemns drunkenness because that relinquishes control of your faculties and you come under the influence of alcohol. And we are to be under the influence of the Spirit. I know Christians have difference of opinions on alcohol, but we should all, I think, be united on drunkenness as a sin. I don't know how you get around that. All right, we're clear on that, right? Drunkenness is a sin. It's not wise. It is darkness. It is not light. So the Scriptures have nothing good to say about alcohol, right? Wrong. Wrong. If that were the case, Christians wouldn't be divided on the issue. Like I said, the Bible's clear drunkenness is a sin. The Bible does not condemn alcohol, though. The Bible, I believe, teaches alcohol as a gift from Yahweh. Say, what? Where do you get that stuff? Let's look at some scriptures. Psalm 104, verse 14. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of man so that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine which make man's heart glad so that he may make his face glisten with oil and food which sustains man's heart. Now, the Hebrew word here for wine is yayin. Mark that in your brain. Yayin. We're coming back to that word, but I want you to know this word because we're gonna, it's going to be important. Yayin. Keep that in mind. All right. The word for glad here is sama, which means to brighten up, to cheer up, to make glad, to make merry, to cause to rejoice. So this wine has a positive effect on the drinker, correct? I mean, that's what the psalm is saying. The wine that makes man's heart glad. Now, Ben Franklin wrote this. Behold the rain which descends from heaven upon the vineyards. There it enters the roots of the vines to be changed into wine. 
a constant proof that God loves us and loves to see us happy. <laughs> yeah, I think he's close on that. Uh, you know, it's often accredited to Franklin that he said God made beer because, you know, well, that's, that's never, Franklin never said that. Uh, you find it in breweries all over the place, that saying, but Franklin never said that. This is what he said, so they kind of took this part of it and just made, turned it into beer because they didn't like wine, I guess, so whatever. Look at Ecclesiastes 9, 7. So then, eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already proved your works. Enjoy it is the whole idea here. That's what God created it for. Amos 9, 14. Also, I will restore the captivity of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. Drinking wine from your own vineyard is a sign of Yahweh's blessing. See, he's returning the people of Israel from captivity. Now they're be able to do this again. And it's a form of blessing. As we've seen, Proverbs has a lot to say about the destruction that drunkenness brings. But notice what chapter 31 says here. Give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to him whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his trouble no more. Now that's interesting, all right? That's an interesting text. Wine is to be used to cheer those up whose life is bitter. So the Bible condemns drunkenness, but it does not condemn drinking. The Bible also says that our Lord Yeshua drank wine, and he created wine. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, 23, to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake. From these and other scriptures, I think it's clear that alcohol itself is not inherently sinful. Rather, it's the abuse of alcohol. It's drunkenness. It's just like the abuse of food is sinful. Now, all the people and all the preachers that rant and rail against drunkenness and drinking... Don't ever say much about gluttony and overeating. There's probably a reason for that, okay? <laughs> but it's abuse that's wrong. Moderation, that's what we have to learn to do things in moderation. So what I see is that the Scriptures clearly condemn drunkenness. It is foolish. It is destructive. But the use of alcohol in moderation is not forbidden. And it seems the purpose of alcohol is to cheer the heart. Now those who say that Christians should not drink alcohol at all attempt to teach that the alcohol of the Bible is different than the alcohol today. For example, and I'm using John MacArthur at this because he, he's just a person I know well. And, and, this, and this is his position. All right, His position is, you know, alcohol, no Christian should really partake of that. You'll see this in a minute. But MacArthur writes this, the wine of the Bible times was not necessarily the same as the wine we have today. The wine drunk today is unmixed with water. It is straight wine. That is not true of biblical wine. All right, he goes on to say, first of all, some of the wine of the Bible times was absolutely unintoxicating. It was not, it was just not fermented. It was unintoxicating. All right, so he's trying to say that this, this wine they had in the Bible, you couldn't get drunk on it in any sense. He says, Professor Samuel Lee of Cambridge University says this, that yayin, mixed wine, so he's trying to say that yayin, that's what yayin means, is mixed wine. In other words, it's wine, you put a lot of water in, you just water it down to nothing. Or oinos does not refer, that's a New Testament, that's a Greek word for wine, does not refer only to intoxicating liquor made by fermentation, but much more often refers to a thick, unintoxicating syrup or jam produced, produced by, and then MacArthur says, watch this, boiling to make it storable. Now, MacArthur goes on to say, what I'm trying to say is this. If you want to defend the fact that you can drink wine today on the basis of the fact that they drank it in the Bible, then you need to re-examine whether what we drink today is the same as what they drank then. And we find out as we get close to the subject that they drank what was either totally unintoxicating, such as the syrup base, which was diluted with water, that was 
intoxicate that its intoxication level was very, very minimal. So he's trying to say the stuff the Bible talks about, you couldn't even get drunk on it. All right, he goes on to say, first of all, the most common word in the New Testament is oinos. The Greek word oinos is a word that simply refers to the juice of grapes. All right, so this is basically when the Bible says wine, he says it says means grape juice. All right. It's a very general word. It is used very commonly in its, normally, in its normal New Testament word for wine. Now, the Old Testament equivalent for oinos is yayin. That's the Hebrew word. It's used 141 times in the Old Testament. And the word yayin is referring to, watch this one, wine that is mixed. Not with other wine, but usually with water. So he's saying yayin. In the, in the, Tanakh, the Tanakh talks about this. It's a Hebrew word. It's referring to mixed wine. So in other words, you got this grape juice kind of stuff or you got this stuff mixed with water. MacArthur goes on to argue that uh, Horace, Pliny, Aristotle all prove that you know, they didn't have wine back then. They just had this other diluted stuff. Tries to prove what the Bible talks about was not intoxicating. Now let me ask you this, all right? He says here, oinos is a word that simply refers to grape juice. Why in the world would Paul say to the Ephesians, do not be drunk on grape juice? <laughs> Paul, what is wrong with you, man? Grape juice, I never, and no one ever got drunk on grape juice, Paul. Paul used the word oinos, same word they're talking about. Oinos doesn't mean something you can get drunk on. Then why tell them that? Grape juice doesn't make people drunk. <laughs> I think maybe what MacArthur and them believe is, see, Ephesians 5 is written to us, telling us don't be drunk on wine. You know, but I kind of take it as Ephesians is written to the Ephesians. It's written to them, and he's telling them don't be drunk, and they're the ones who have the wine that will make you drunk. But maybe he's writing this to a, later audience that will read it in the 21st century when wine is really stronger and so maybe it's for us. No, it's not, okay? This argument is just ridiculous. R.A. Torrey represented the position that wine that Christ provided was unfermented. See, a lot of writers try, they go to great lengths to wrest scripture from its moorings to try to come up with some, support their view. He says, Jesus provided wine but there is not a hint I'm going to show you there's a few hints. That the wine he made was intoxicating. He was, it was fresh made wine. Well, we know that. I don't know how he made it. He just, you know, it just happened there, all right? New made wine is never intoxicating. It is not intoxicating until sometime after the process of fermentation has set in. Now, he took water and turned it instantly into wine, but he couldn't have instantly had it fermented, Okay. <laughs> Fermentation is a process of decay. Now watch what he does here. There is not a hint that our Lord produced alcohol, which is a product of decay or death. He produced a living wine, which means grape juice, uncontaminated by fermentation. It is true, he says, it was better wine than had, they had been drinking. Okay? So he admits that. But that does not show for a moment that it was more fermented than that which they had before been drinking. That's from difficulties in the Bible. There are significant problems with this argument. New wine was fermented. Its ability to cause intoxication is well represented in the Scripture. Having received the gift of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, the apostles are speaking in tongues. They're sharing the gospel with people. Some people are amazed, but others accuse them of what? Drunk. You're drunk. Acts 2.13. But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. Now, sweet wine here is from the Greek, glucose. All right? You know what that means, right? How could the apostles be accused of being intoxicated from a drink that's not fermented? Others are mocking him, saying, they're full of grape juice. <laughs> Bunch of grape juice and vibers. You know, what is that supposed to mean? What were they accusing him of? There's no indication 
either in the culture of the day or in the Bible, that there was such a thing as unfermented wine. Wine is wine because it is fermented. Now, some scholars have attempted to contrast the two Hebrew terms for wine in the Tanakh to make a case that one of them is referring to unfermented wine or grape juice. However, the evidence doesn't support such a conclusion. The Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible draws this conclusion about the term tirosh. This is a Hebrew word that they say refers to grape juice. It's often translated in the Bible as new wine or fresh wine. And see, because it says new wine, they say, well, it's just grape juice. That's new wine, right? No, it's grape juice until it gets fermented. Then it's wine, all right? Or fresh wine. All right, they say this. The Hebrew word is found in primarily neutral context. Often the particular word is found in context definitely including a fermented beverage. The Ugardic parallel to the term in question refers with certainty to a fermented wine. The Septuagint equivalents refer to fermented wine. Fermentation in the ancient East, unlike Greece, took only about three days. The Mishnah provides no evidence of the practice of having unfermented wine. There seems to have been no attempts to preserve wine in an unfermented state. It may have been a near impossible task. The article concludes a careful examination of all the Hebrew words as well as their Semitic cognates and the Greek words for wine demonstrate that the Asian, ancients knew little, if anything, about unfermented wine. Now, there are several Hebrew and Greek words for wine in our English Bible. How do we know which one means fermented wine? Well, to find the answer, you don't need to go to Aristotle, you don't need to go to Pliny, but go to the Bible and compare the usages. Look at the scriptural meaning of wine and find out how it's used in that context. One of the original Hebrew words for wine is yayin. Remember what MacArthur said about yayin? The word yayin is referring to wine that is mixed. He says it's intoxicating. Well, notice the first use of yayin in Genesis. He drank of the wine, yayin, and became drunk. Anybody got to see a problem right there? What, there you know, what he's saying is he drank of the grape juice, and he got drunk. Wine here is yayin. Was this grape juice or some super diluted wine with water that got him drunk? No. The, this wine, whatever it is, it caused drunkenness. The word drunk here is from the Hebrew word shachar. It means drunk. The same word is used in 1 Samuel 1.14. Then Eli said to her, how long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. Wine here, again, is yayin. Eli thought she was drunk from Yayin. Now, why would he think that she would be drunk from something you can't get drunk from? It doesn't make any sense. In the New Testament, one Greek word for wine is oinos, and proof that it is alcoholic is given in the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, 34. And he came to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, oinos, on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Why did this Samaritan pour oil and wine on a man's wounds? What's the point of alcohol? Okay, a disin alcohol is a disinfectant. How good is it going to do this guy to pour grape juice on his wound? I got some grape juice. Let me pour it in that wound. That'll fix it right up. Let me just need a little sugar in your wound there. It'll be all better, right? That doesn't make any sense. Now, MacArthur gives eight questions that we must ask to try to convince us that no Christian should ever drink alcohol. All right? I'm not going to go through all those questions. Some of them are just plain foolish. But his first question is this. Is it the same as the wine in the Bible times? And he tried to prove that it wasn't the same. I hope I've shown you it is the same. All right? That wine that they drank was intoxicating. People got drunk on it. Well, his next question was this. Is it necessary? Is it necessary? He says, today you can drink anything. I mean, the cupboards in the markets are just jammed full of stuff. Everything conceivable. We would have to say this. Is drinking wine necessary today? What's the answer? No, it is not necessary. So it moves out of the category of necessary and into the category of preference. This is a stupid non-argument. How many Christians today say, I'm drinking because there's just nothing else to drink but alcohol? 
You ever heard a Christian say that? I, there's nothing else to drink. There's no water. There's no anything. I have to drink alcohol. What a dumb argument. We know it's not necessary. It's a matter of choice. And it's a choice that you're allowed to make as a Christian because it's not a moral issue. To drink alcohol is okay as long as you don't get drunk. MacArthur's third question is this. Is it the best choice? And here's where it gets interesting. Is it the best choice? I really think he's a little deceitful here, but maybe he's just confused. Uh, Matthew 11, 11, He says, Truly I say to you, among those born of woman, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So he says, first of all, I want you to understand, John the Baptist was the greatest man that ever lived, right? Then he says this, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. So he says, here's the greatest man that ever lived. He was a teetotaler. All right? So he says, our best choice then is to abstain from alcohol. He's the greatest man. We want to be like him. We should be teetotalers. And I'm like, well, I'd rather be like Yeshua than like John the Baptist. And he was not a teetotaler. So what's his argument? Just fell apart right there. All right? Well, he then cites this in Leviticus. Yahweh then spoke to Aaron saying, do not drink wine or strong drink. Neither you nor your sons with you when you come into the tent of meeting so that you will not die. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generation. Now MacArthur argues that Yahweh didn't want the priest to drink and we are priests today. So therefore, we should not drink. But there's one problem with that argument. Do you see it already in that text? When are they not to drink? When you come into the tent of meeting. In other words, when you're ministering, don't be drinking. I need you clear-headed. And you can end up dead if you mess up when going into that tent, all right? Neither you or your son's with you. So he's not saying don't ever drink wine. He's saying don't drink it when you're ministering. The priests were allowed to drink alcohol. Speaking to Aaron, Yahweh says this, All the best of the fresh oil and all the best of the fresh wine and of the grain, the first fruits of those which they gave to Yahweh, I give to you. All right, now let me ask them, what is the point of giving them wine if they can't drink it? The Hebrew word for wine here, triash, some say it's referring to grape juice, unfermented wine. Well, it's the same Hebrew word that's used in Hosea 4.11. Harlotry, wine, and new wine take away the understanding. Wine here is yayin, new wine is triage, and notice that they both do something. They take away the understanding. They make men fools, okay? So the priest could drink wine, and so could the people. They just were not allowed to be drunk. Deuteronomy 14, verse 22 through 27 shares commandments regarding the tithe and how the tithe was to be used. Notice verse 26. You may spend the money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your heart desires, and there you shall eat in the presence of Yahweh your God and rejoice, you and your household. So the priests could drink wine and so could the people. There is only one group in all the Bible that was explicitly forbidden from drinking alcohol. Who was that? Uh, the Nazarites, all right? According to Numbers 6, 1 through 4. But you know, the Nazarites couldn't eat grapes. Now, I don't think a grape's going to get you drunk. But they couldn't, they, nothing of the vine. They couldn't eat the grapes. They couldn't drink the wine. They couldn't do anything. Now, here's what you got to understand, okay? Yeshua was not a Nazarite. He was a Nazarene, Okay? He was a native of Nazareth. And Yeshua never took a Nazarite vow. And he did drink alcohol. We'll look at that in a minute. So I would say that alcohol is not a bad choice if done in moderation and at the proper time. All right, Mark MacArthur says it's not a good choice. You know, no one should ever make that choice. Well, I disagree with him. The priests couldn't drink when they were ministering. And kings were not to drink when they were making decisions. Alcohol affects us, so I think we use wisdom as to when we drink it. And one aspect of that would be today, you shouldn't drink and drive. All right? That's, it, it dulls your senses. It has some effect on you. That's why people drink it. Okay? 
So you have to use wisdom and when you drink it. Paul Harvey writes this, Tests show that after drinking three bottles of beer, there is an average of 13% net memory loss. After taking all, only small quantities of alcohol, trained typists were tested and their errors increased 40%. They had more fun typing, but they weren't as accurate, okay? <laughs> only, one, only one ounce of alcohol increases the time required to make a decision by decreases no, only one ounce of alcohol increases the time required to make a decision by nearly 10%. It hinders muscle reaction by 70%, increases errors due to lack of attention by 35%. So the idea is that we need to act wisely. And, you know, if you're operating heavy machinery, if you're driving a car, if you're doing, you know, making some important decisions, don't be drinking. It has an influence. You don't have to be drunk for it to have an influence on you. So Christians need to act wisely when drinking. Not drive, don't go performing brain surgery. You know, use your brain. One of the other questions that MacArthur asked in an attempt to say that all Christians should abstain is, is it offensive to other Christians? Mm, that's a big argument, isn't it? Oh, your brother will stumble. The, those who are teetotalers wrongly teach that drinking is not sinful, they'll say. Well, it's not sinful to drink, but all Christians should avoid drinking out of love for their brothers. You don't want to cause someone to stumble. It's okay to drink, but you just shouldn't do it. Okay? Because you don't want to cause your brother to stumble. Notice what Paul wrote. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles. Now I want you to notice something here in this verse. He is saying here that wine is a non-moral thing because that's the whole category here. He's not talking about sin issues in this category. If he's talking about sin, you know, he'd just say, don't do it, it's sin. But he's saying, don't do some things for your brother's sake, which are not sin. So it's not a sin to drink wine. Or he could not have used it as an illustration here. And I would say that, you know, Christians should avoid drinking in the presence of others who have a problem with that. You know, if I, if I know somebody's an alcoholic or they struggle with that, I'm not going to drink in front of them or around them. I mean, that's just common sense. That's love, caring about somebody else. You know, if you can't do without a drink for a while because your brother's there and you might hurt him, then you have a problem. But I think it's unreasonable to demand that all Christians abstain at all times just because you might offend somebody. All right? In his book, God Gave Wine, Kenneth Gentry argues for the biblical freedom among God's people to consume alcohol in moderation. Now, here's what's interesting about the book. Gentry is a teetotaler. So he's not trying to prove a point. He's simply trying to deal with the Scripture. And I, I like that because I always look for an agenda behind something. Okay? In other words, I do drink beer, so it, you know, am I just trying to prove my point? I don't know. I hope not. It's not that important to me. I just think it's what the Bible says. And that's why I think Gentry's book is all the more powerful. Gentry in his book writes this. Christians should avoid causing an actual person to actually stumble. But to seek to avoid causing a hypothetical person to hypothetically stumble is unreasonable, if not impossible when applied to every single issue. And this is what they try to do. You should never drink because someone might hear about it. Someone might, you know, that's, that's just being stupid. He says, for example, I love this illustration. For example, if a skinny person eats dessert in front of a dieting obese glutton, they could tempt them to sin by also eating dessert. So in love, they should forgo it. But to tell the skinny person to never eat dessert again, even at home alone with his or her skinny wife, spouse, because someone somewhere who eats cake by the sheet instead of the slice may hear about this dessert consumption and may be thrown into a frosting frenzy is unreasonable. <laughs> it's a hilarious illustration, but you get the point, right? Because that's exactly what these Christians, you should never drink. Because someone will hear about it, you even drink at home. Someone somehow will find it. They'll see it in your trash. They'll see you in the store buying it. Somehow, it's going to hurt them. And he goes, you know, come on. Let's use our heads. Much of the taboo regarding Christian drinking is cultural. All right? I've talked to a lot of missionaries, and I'll tell you, one of the missionaries told me, he says, whenever we had Americans come to the orphanage to visit, we had to hide the alcohol. Because it offended them. You know, he says, 
overseas, and I've talked to a lot of missionaries, and a lot of places, alcohol is not a problem in any country but the United States. And no other country has a problem with drunkenness like the United States does either. You know, which is just weird. They don't have a problem with alcohol, but they don't abuse it like we do. We just are known for abusing everything, I guess. Many great Christians down through history have been drinkers. John Calvin's annual salary package including up, included upwards of 250 gallons of wine to be enjoyed by he and his guests. When I read that, I thought, I need to renegotiate my contract. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's right. My wife is agreeing with me. Wow, mark that down. <laughs> That's right. Martin Luther, who was known for drinking, he used to sit around. Martin Luther had what called table talks. They would sit around, drink dark beer, and discuss theology. Amen. Now, some Christians say, oh, I can't even imagine that. They drink and discuss theology. Here's what Luther himself said. Here's how Luther explained the Reformation. He says, while I sat and drank beer with Philip and Amsdorf, God dealt the papacy, papacy a mighty blow. <laughs> So Luther said, we're sitting around enjoying ourselves and God's deal, you know, so he, he, doesn't, he didn't give himself credit for doing that, all right? If it was wrong or not the best choice for Christians to drink alcohol, why did our Lord make and drink alcohol? That just seems like a, a tension there for me, you know, that he's going to make it and drink. Of course, some people say he didn't make it. Well, let's look at this verse, uh, these bunch of verses here in John chapter 2. Um, you're familiar with the story. On the third day, there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Yeshua was there, and both Yeshua and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine, now, by the way, the wedding festivals were not like ours. It wasn't three hours long. It was a week. All right, they partied for a week. It was a big deal for them, all right? When the wine ran out, so it's not like, oh, we had two hours worth of wine's already gone. No, who knows how long they've been drinking, all right? The wine ran out. The mother of Yeshua said to him, they have no wine. And Yeshua said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Yeshua said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and didn't know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first. Now, you know why you do that? Because once people are a little tipsy, yeah, they're not going to know it's the bad. Get out the cheap stuff now, all right? They're already on the way. And when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Wow, this is the good stuff. This beginning of his signs Yeshua did in Cana of Galilee and manifest his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now the question raised by this passage does indeed contribute a great deal to the overall debate. If Christ turned the water into an alcoholic beverage, then his participation in the issue certainly doesn't bode well for those who preach total abstinence. Throughout the passage, the Greek word translated wine is oinos, which was the common Greek word for normal wine. Wine that was fermented, wine that was alcoholic. The Greek word for wine Yeshua created is the same word for the wine the wedding fest festival ran out of. The, the wine they ran out of was oinos. The wine he created was oinos. The Greek word for wine Yeshua created is also the same word that's used in Ephesians 5.18. Be not drunk with oinos. So, all the same word. Obviously, getting drunk from drinking wine requires the presence of alcohol. Everything from the context of the wedding feast, okay, they're having a wedding, they're enjoying themselves, to the usage of oinos in the first century Greek literature, in the New Testament and outside the New Testament, argue for wine that Yeshua created to be normal, ordinary wine containing alcohol. There's simply no solid, historical, cultural, exegetical, contextual, lexical evidence to make this be grape juice. There just isn't. The word for drunk here is methuo, 
which means to become intoxicated. When they have drunk freely, when they're a little intoxicated, then he serves the poorer wine. And that just, you understand that. The only testimony, testimony we have about the state of the wine that Christ created is from the head waiter's review of it. And he suggests that it is the type that can intoxicate. It's very difficult to draw any other conclusion for that. He said, wow, you saved the best stuff. He didn't say, what's this grape juice? What am I going to do with that? You know? Yeshua made wine, and he drank wine. According to his own testimony, he drank wine that others abstained from. Notice uh, Luke 7. For John the Baptist has come eating and drinking. Or John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine. And you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And you say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So Yeshua goes on to tell the religious leaders that accused him falsely of being a drunkard that he's not, all right? He was never a drunkard any more than he was a glutton. He lived a completely sinless life, but he did drink. John, he says, didn't drink wine. Yeshua did drink wine. Luke 7 suggests that Yeshua did indeed partake of alcoholic wine. Paul tells us, do not get drunk with wine. That's clear. I don't really see how we're going to get around that. And I said, we've seen the rest of the scriptures back that up. The scripture, I see the scriptures as saying that drunkenness is a sin. It is foolish. It is harmful. It is destructive. Believers are not to get drunk. But I think the scriptures also teach there's nothing wrong with us using alcohol in moderation. Just like there's nothing wrong with using food in moderation. And again, Psalm 104 says, A wine which makes man's heart glad. That's the purpose of it. To cheer them. We are never, people, never to be controlled by alcohol. We are always to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. We are to walk in wisdom, which is a sober walk. And we'll talk about the walk of the Holy Spirit in future weeks because that's the, that's the idea. We are to be controlled by the Spirit. And I think you all understand that when you drink too much alcohol, you're controlled by it. You do. You say things you should not do and say that you wouldn't do and say if you weren't controlled by it. And again, just, you know, I want to make my point absolutely clear. I have no problem with drinking. I have a great problem with drunkenness. And so does the Bible. All right? To have a few drinks, I think, is perfectly legit. There's no biblical injunction against that. But when Christians get drunk, they're putting themselves in grave danger. That's when bad stuff happens, people. That's when bad stuff happens. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray your people would be wise and learn to use the blessings you have given us in moderation. Lord, I thank you for all that you've provided for us, the food, the alcohol, the so many blessings you've given us that we might enjoy life. May we enjoy it, Lord, for your glory, for your honor. May we enjoy it, Lord, within the guidelines that you have given us, that you may be glorified. Amen.